They say that there are three levels of conversation. Level one is when people talk about other people. Level two is when people talk about events. There's nothing wrong with either of those, but this is level three studio. Level three is when people talk about ideas and what is possible. Welcome to Level 3 Studio, where we feed your body, feed your mind, without a doubt, feed your soul. Let's take a toast. All right, man. I'm, I'm really excited to have you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just right there. Hey, and I'm just sitting here like, that's nice, y'all. I'm watching him hold my drink. Like, okay, cool. All right, man, truly, uh, each one of these episodes humbles my heart that people would take the time to come here, but especially this group. I'm so excited. So cheers to a good conversation. Cheers, 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 cheers. This show will go in by three segments. We're not bound to those three segments, um, but but the format is how we'll go through this. So the first segment is called practical and tactical. It's like, what do you spend your time doing 24 hours in a day? How do you break it down? Do you intentionally break it down? Do you roll through it? Um, whatever the case. Second segment is called True North. Um, what part of your life story has meant the most to you? What drives you? What interactions uh, in your life have inspired you the most? We'll break, enjoy a meal, and close it out with Innovator's Toolbox, which is these back here. We'll go around the room, and everyone will say one reflection from the conversation um, that they would leave behind in this Innovator's Toolbox, which we are compiling uh, to then give to young people around the world to inspire them to be the next generation to make a difference. <laughs> Segment one. First question. If there are a million things to do in a day, what do you decide to do first? Anything that has to do with people mm -hmm. and building relationships. So I had a response, but I, I now want to ask something different. What gets in the way of doing that? Daily tasks, daily mm -hmm. responsibilities, everything else. Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and the that's, other things that get in the way. Right, that's why I'm so excited about this group because I really feel like everyone here is extremely passionate about putting people first. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the thing I'm trying to figure out is like, is, is the world not built on that and that everyone wants to do that? Or is the world built on putting people last? And then there's just like good crusaders who are trying to make a difference. You know what I mean? Like, what do you feel like you come across most often? Uh, well, I think just personally, my, I, I love people. I love building relationships. I love developing other people. And the tasks that get in the way are part of um, maybe even just jotting down what it is that we talked about so mm -hmm. I can remember it later on. Mm -hmm. But that's not my strong suit. That's a small detail that, you know, I just don't enjoy necessarily doing, but it's a must mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to achieve It comes along whatever. with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you found a way to, to shorten that process and be more efficient there so that you can get back to what you love to do? Maybe not shorten it, but not put it off. Yeah. Uh, it's always what I try to, you know, do at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, people are leaving the office or, you know, I, I want to go work out or I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's easy to say, I'll just do it later. Mm -hmm. So trying to force, and I hate to use the word force, but really be intentional about putting it yeah. in a place where I know I can't yeah. avoid it yeah, yeah, yeah. and get it done soon so I can move on to other stuff. I saw this quote that said, discipline takes over um, whenever motivation leaves. Cause like we all know motivation is fleeting. Mm -hmm. Like it's, we try to all be inspired, which, which hopefully lasts a lifetime. But getting to that point of inspiration can be so difficult. So we try to motivate ourselves. But boy, I, when, you know, when you just trying to push through on pure motivation, <laughs> <laughs> you get tired, you out. All right, Stan, what you got for me, man? You, you said you had a good one, man. If, uh, if there's my, a million things initial, to do. My initial thought when you said there's a million things to do, I feel like you do nothing first. You do nothing. When I, when I say that, I say you sit back and observe and prioritize the most important thing out of those million things. Uh, you obviously can't get all a million things accomplished in one setting, so why not trick? Why trick your mind to think that you can? So what I do is I prioritize my day. I I have certain events that have that are coming up. I have certain caseload things that I have to do. So what I do is I just prioritize it. What means the most to me and what needs to get done at that point in time. So so please feel free, everyone, take the time uh, as as it arises to talk about what you're doing. You know, in your lives, the work, the the spaces. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how have you been able to carve out like time to literally just be able to reflect and prioritize? Or is it in the morning or night or 
I try to. Various. I try to, but my day goes so fast. So it's getting uh, moving quickly. It, it moves very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and this, I guess, is the time I can kind of elaborate on what I do. Uh, on a daily basis, I work with kids. So I'm an educator at Benjamin Banneker Elementary. So I deal with a lot of discipline as well as caseload students. So I have about 40 or I have 72 kids on my caseload. And what I do is I meet with them once a, once a month, just figuring out their problems, trying to figure out how I can help them and be assistance to them. Most of the time, I'm in the Kansas City Public School District, so most of the parents don't even know how to uh, advocate for their student. So that's where I come in to kind of advocate for them, to let them know some of the things that they can do, some of the different uh, methods and different things they can get around. You know, maybe their kid is not in the right program or right class, got the right IEP, 401 plan, all that different things. So, Do you feel like though parents are, are willing to engage with the district? No. Is it animosity or just disconnect or uh, what do you, what do you... so so many parents have been lied to so mm -hmm. many situations have happened that parents are just un detached from uh, working with the administrators right, to, right. in which uh, it's supposed to be a system you know right. it takes a village to raise a family or to raise a child so if you don't have the person that's educating your child as well as the parent on the same page how can you expect the kid to come out 100 percent when you don't have the two people or the two main pieces in their life on the same accord how do you feel like you've been able to bridge that gap and i'm curious i don't know how often you get the chance to interact with with your students um caretakers or family um, but i'm curious for both of you how, how do you try to bridge that gap between a system that i mean we all come to understand is broken to some degree right yeah. and has its challenges yeah. um but that also that the value and the importance of bringing family in and connecting them like how do you how do you bridge with, that with respect to education you have to have people that are in place that are really motivated to stand with the kids like the kids are going through issues and things that as a kid i didn't go through you know and with my mother and being from the south like we was focused you know on family you know on uh, it just was there was time. no question if it was a priority yes yeah, it, yeah. It, was, it was definitely a priority my mama made sure she checked my homework before the night was over with or different things like that so it's just key pieces that we're missing do you do you navigate that um it's an interesting um line you have to walk because when you're so passionate about um helping kids man to really create impact in these kids sometimes it's almost like man i I can't care more than you, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Like, cause if, if I yeah. do, I'm wasting time on the potential kids that's like, dog, ready I'm to here, go, ready right. to go. Right, right, right. Like, what's up, right? right? You're gonna get frustrated. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? Cause they're, they're, they're not going to go get with it at all. Mm -hmm. I'm in an alternative school. So it's, it's like, man, please, I don't, I don't wanna do any of that for real, mm -hmm. right? And so you wonder why it's like that. And then you get the opportunity to meet the parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's a hot moment. Yeah. Right? There's, there's, you have that first conversation with him, and it's like, it's, it's oh, crazy. I see why you it's talk crazy. this away. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yes. It's crazy. Yeah. And so we'll have a parent-teacher conference, right? And no parents come. None. Yeah. Right? I had one so, out of 40 just this last one. Exactly. Yeah. So how do we even begin to show the importance if the people that create the biggest impact mm. don't even show up to find out mm. if you're committed? Mm. Right. They're, they're not even there's no accountability right. from the right. jump. Yeah. So, yeah. There's none. So you got to you opening up lying, deceit, laziness, everything. Right. Because there's no accountability to the very thing that begins the accountability next to chores. Right. Right. right? right. Education is it. So, so so let me ask this like in a perfect world like this. This works. Right. And, and what we're doing and, and why we build it creates influence on the next generation. And you had a chance to authentically fill that void of accountability. What would you propose that they, that they find themselves being accountable to? Mm, their effort. Um, and I think more than the effort, before we pay attention to the effort, I'm really on this perception kick, man. Perception? Yeah, perception means everything. Um, um, so one of my mentors, he's, he's told me, and I've been sticking with it for a while, but your reality is trying to catch up to your perception of you and life, mm. right? And like so your, your physical reality, every day to day. What, how you view it, mm -hmm. everything, right? If all the lights are off and you got, a, you got a hat rack behind your door, right? If all the lights is off, you might see, think it's a person behind that door, right? Until you turn on the lights and realize it's just a hat rack, right? And so a lot of us, 
in our situations have been told the wrong things, right? Our kids have been told the wrong things, so that is their perception, mm -hmm. right? And when you build that perception, it's, it's almost impossible to move beyond that perception unless you show them what that looks like. They have to have a physical representation of the perception you're trying to show them or it's impossible. But I, but I think that goes along with the lines of them being lied to. That Absolutely. Because we, we can't, because it's like, oh, I've been told that story before. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a coach of a basketball team at Benjamin Bennett. I coach my fifth and sixth grade team. So trying to convince them, you know, that I'm not going to, that they're not going to make it to the NBA or different things like that. You know, that's true. They You cannot tell them anything right. other than that, that they're the next Curry line, or they Because it's that one kid that make, he, he can't wait to come back and get you, right? So you, but, so but you don't I, want I, to right. tear someone away. Yeah, from, yeah but I, I say it with respect to line, it's, it's like, Pretty much people have made so many broken promises to them, so many different things that they have said I was going to do, or maybe it was their dad or different things like that. I know coming from uh, where my dad wasn't always in my life, but I don't use it as an excuse, you know, and they are coping with it and trying to figure out a way to, oh, he said he's going to come pick me up this weekend, different things right, in the, right, that, right, that's right, happening. Right, right. and it's, That you can it, start to see yeah, kind of why that cracked. Yeah. I'm curious for you two, and, and I'm going to say this to each one of you throughout the show, like I'm so grateful that y'all are here. <laughs> Um, like this is like the I, I recognize it every show because this is just really freaking cool. But like, what do you feel like was one of the things that built such a strong foundation for you both? Like, what are the things that you feel like allowed you to kind of step into life as you do now? I think that my foundation was really built off of not having. So I was born with a single mother who was 19 years old, and she didn't have anything at the time, you know. And I think that you know. Going back to the lying, the deceit, whatever it may be, and the perception thing as well combined, I didn't have a dad around. You know, I didn't have that person in my life. Whether you want to see it that way or not, I think that I am where I am because I didn't have a dad. Mm. And I appreciate where I am, 100%. Mm. Did you come into that as you got older, or were you always pretty conscious of that? Like, I'm, I'm going to use whatever's going on in my life to fuel me. And um, I think that... In the beginning, probably it wasn't like that. I right. don't think my mind just fr just frustrated kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Um, but as I started to grow and in, in adult life, in my career, whatever it may be, um, I think that I just chose. I made the choice. My perception was my reality. Mm -hmm. You know, I decided, hey, I'm stepping foot into playing college soccer. I'm gonna make this the best opportunity that I can. I'm setting foot in an industry that has never been touched by someone like myself. I'm gonna make it the way that I want it to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Choice, man. That's that's one thing I wrestle with I, a lot. I think uh, to to a point where you said that when you can't make that choice, that's when you pretty much overcame adversity. A lot of people, when they get to that point, they either repel or uh, right. pull away from can, it. Can you can you teach? That's one. That's the place I'm at right now. Is like, yeah. can you teach? How to overcome adversity, or just some people no, cut out. No, you, you just, just. I was just kind of. It's kind of like you built for it. Like your cer certain things in your life that has happened to you, call or mold you into the person that you are. Cer certain situations, certain things that you battle, certain o obstacles that you overcome, it created you, and it allows you to be able to come to the point where you uh, battle certain things. You are either gonna be tested, or you're gonna figure out, oh, I'm weak in this area, or I can't handle this. I mean, it just it just comes with time. Um, I don't think you can teach it, but I think, you know, one of, the things, one of the things I'm realizing right now is having a vision is very important. Knowing where you want to go, because yes, everyone is going to have those moments where you're like, this is tough and I'm either going to overcome it or I'm going to choose the path of least right. resistance and we go elsewhere. Right, yeah, right, everyone right. faces that. But the people that push through that are the people that have visions. They know why they're doing it. They mm -hmm. know how they're going to do it. They have a plan for it. So I don't think you can teach that, but I think you can teach where do you want to go. The, the other side of that. Exactly. Right, 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 right. And at the end, it's the, and it's going to be their choice. Because then, then it's just something not. along the way towards. Right. You, also, you, can also, you can also think yeah. about the conversation of having it with a student that has a vision on where they want to go and a student that doesn't have a vision. The conversation is two different, different. conversations. Mm -hmm. And you can tell within that. But I think I think it's important to bring up the question: Where do you not want to be? Because Just as much as where do you want to be? Right. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes. 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 No, I, t I tell man, and this this might be where I, we all like cro right, cross the line. We wouldn't be in the positions in these schools if we weren't willing to cross the line every once in a while. Yeah. But I was talking to my kids the other day. The bell rang. Right. They all running in. They all running in. I said, Do you know where else they play this bell at? And they were thinking, like, No, no, no. 
I said, I can only think of two places. One is an assembly line, right? Mm -hmm. You go, gosh, and the other one is prison mm -hmm. for you to go back to wherever the hell you're supposed to be, yeah. right? Yeah. And then I said, well, let's, let's walk through this, right? If, if, if that's where we at right here, yeah. and, 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 and y'all are copacetic, and, but you fight it until they put a little more pressure, then you go back into what they, where, where, where is it that we're going to end up? You know what I mean? Like, where you want to go is just much, no, do y'all, but I think that there's so many people that and, and, that are a part of this system, right, that I don't even think consciously understand that that's what we're shaping our kids yeah. to do, right, that we're separating them. Yeah. And, and so I, I struggle a lot with, man, if I'm in this space, same idea of like being in a space and trying to bring in parents, like being in a space that, that may unconsciously be pushing kids in one or the other direction. How do you how do you how do you cultivate them to have that vision too? Let me uh, let me let me break down a little bit on that. Oh man! Oh look, so man, we you know for someone like myself that had this particular mindset that our youth is dealing with now and i can acknowledge how, how would you define that first of all so how would you define it uh, the, the mindset i mean you know i was a you become a product of your environment you know because your mind isn't built on strength it's you know you 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 embrace your weaknesses because you don't see strength anywhere else our youth struggle because their parents aren't strong enough you know, and like, so when we always talk about how can we um, help our youth be successful, it starts at home. And we have to find a way how we can interact with the parents to teach them something different so that they, the things that are being taught to their children mm -hmm. can be relayed back at home. Right. And for me as a father, you know, like my daughter's eight now, you know, when she wakes up in the morning and tell me that she's going to have a great day. I'm instilling the right things in her head. You know, she specifically told me yesterday in a car, she said, man, it's a girl in my class that said, your daddy's cool, and I want to be just like him. Mm -hmm. And she's, she seen you online? So yeah. Person, all the kids have seen me online. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is what she's, she said. She told her, you can as long as you follow your dreams. Uh, and this is, oh, man, I had the biggest smile on my face <laughs> headed to the gym. And what I, what I realized is that my daughter's eight, but with that mindset, it's because I'm instilling it. But I wouldn't have been able to instill it if I didn't have it myself. And, and you know, um, and like you, you know, you guys talked about, you know, even like the parent teacher conference. Well, like, um, I remember when I was growing up, you know, my parents didn't come to parent teacher conference. They didn't think of it as being so valuable. My father wasn't in my life. So we, we start to, go off those same actions that we were taught and so their parents are like man it's not that important mm -hmm. and we have to find a way that you know we can be able to bring not only the, the the children but their parents in and get them involved and that's that's where the hard part's going to be yeah. but when you can teach them that you know that you can change and that's why like i'm a big uh you know i'm big on growth mm -hmm. you have to teach the adult that who they are today Even does not have adult. to exactly because yeah. they can be somebody else tomorrow see they're set in their own ways you know that's like you talking to a six-year-old woman telling her you got to eat healthy now you got to leave fried food alone frederick, frederick douglas said it is easier to build children than to repair broken mm -hmm. and that's what i was about to ask is do you because this is obviously a problem bigger than any of us can ever tackle. Yes. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But especially you guys that are in education, you are obviously, uh, you know, helping shape these young kids. So I, I, you know, I'd hate to say like, are the parents, is it too late for them? But how do you, I think it would be much easier to mm -hmm. start it with the children and, and how can you be a part of that? How can we all be a part of mm -hmm shaping that next generation. I think one, one, one thing I ask myself, I try to look at it from multiple angles, and one question I ask myself is like, what's the low hanging fruit? Like what's, the, like, mm -hmm. what's the, the wins I can get, right? Small ones yeah, leading small up to, to, to start. Like how do you, and maybe like, we'll just think about this bigger and then maybe try to refocus. Like in, in your lives, what is, what is the low hanging fruit? What do the small wins look like for you to just get you momentum, right? Just in your life. In, in, 
push Personally, any of the work forward. So or have, however you want to. Are we talking about respect to the, uh, with the topic as far as on key? Is no, I'm, I'm curious. Like, let's step back and just, like, okay. personally, like, for yourself, and then maybe see, like, how do we then break that down inside of a, a small initiative of education? But for yourself, like, like, what are small wins? Do you work towards them? Does that give you momentum? Like, how, how does that look for you? I think instead of looking at, like, the big picture, like, in, in our industry, we look at an entire year, whether it's, like, an agent's year, whether it's, like, a full calendar year. But it's so hard to view a year. Yeah. A year in itself. When so you, you realize how much really happens in a year. Exactly. Time. Yeah. It's, it's already yeah. it's already March. Right. Mid March. Yeah. Right. Almost April. April. Right. Yeah. Yeah. April. Yeah. April. Yeah. And I think that yeah. you have to break it down not only to the year, but like also the quarters or the months or even the days, mm -hmm. and reflect on those daily wins. Because mm -hmm. if you can say, oh my goodness, there were 10 million different wins in this day, mm -hmm. but if I look at the year in total, I may not remember those That's wins. Awesome. Write yeah. them down. Reflect on them. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about, you know, a million things to do, what is the first thing, you know, you go do? And yeah. I think um, going along with that, a book that um, I read to prepare for this year was the 12-week year, mm -hmm. where it helps you break everything out into 12 weeks instead of even the whole year. Like 12 weeks, 12 weeks. 12 yep. Mm -hmm. So we just finished our first year. Mm -hmm. um, and so you look at, there's a couple of things that go into account, but the first one is having a vision. One of them is obviously you have to have a vision. Um, and you have to break down your annual goals. What do you want to have accomplished in that year? And then simplify it. One to three goals that you're going to focus in these next 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. But it goes further than that where you go and you put down um, on a daily basis and weekly basis, you're tracking. Like, mm -hmm. here's goal one. What are the tactics to get you there? Mm -hmm. And you're going to measure on a daily, weekly basis, did I do that? Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, mm -hmm. like with this book, like it's called checking the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. Like. You have to daily check your scoreboard. Like, yep. how am I tracking for this? Right. Because if I'm falling off and I'm two days in, it's easier to catch back up right. than right. when then I... Then six months later, be like, I did yep. to, to your point, Ryan, like, like accountability, right? And that you, you laid it perfectly. Like, like, there has to be, like, this foundation first of understanding that I must be accountable. Or even understanding, like, accountability is a thing, right? Like... It's almost until you've realized that you wanted to do something and you didn't do it that you realize I gotta hold myself accountable to something. Yeah. I saw I went through like the first 20 years of my life just <laughs> going through the shit. You know what I mean? Just like I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was just I'm just living just living for the living, moment. And and I realized like pretty quickly like okay, I don't know if I do this for another 20 years, where am I gonna be? Right. You know what I mean? And then yeah. started working backwards. So like. One of the things I constantly ask myself, man, is, is it just a point of maturity? You know, like the, the older you get, the more you learn, the more you learn, the more you try to fix it. Or can we can we shorten it down so that people who are younger can accomplish more? We need, we, for one, honestly, I mean, it's a great group of people and I can see it, uh, the characteristics here tonight is that, you know, we need leadership. You know, among, like among ourselves. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have, like you guys are talking about accountability, but you know, you have to put yourself in a position as being a leader at all times as well. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm very motivated. Everybody knows that. <laughs> man. But uh, one, of the, one of the things that we were talking, one of the things we were talking about this, um, this morning was that, I've been able to embrace my reality to another, like to a whole different level. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning and know that I'm paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So everything that I face on a daily basis doesn't mean nothing. Do you think that more people run from that reality, or they, or they just, they just can't recognize what that reality is? They, they can't rec recognize what's paralyzing them. Like mentally, you're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you cannot see yourself being able to provide any obstacle that you, I mean, any opportunity that you want in life, mm -hmm. you're paralyzed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because once you have that vision, like she was talking about earlier, like having that vision, mm -hmm. then you realize that your possibilities are endless mm -hmm. and that you can go for anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we have to find a way to help and it starts with ourselves, you know. It starts by showing someone else, like, man, that you are just like them. Mm -hmm. But if you broke that barrier, you've started to walk again. Mm -hmm. how, how have you cultivated vision? So the way I look at my vision is um, kind of like Brittany, right? And Brittany? All right, so the way Brittany was saying, like, every day I have a different vision. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like one day, like you're truly one day at a time. I'm one. Yeah, man, because I believe that you know you can have a bad day today, yeah. but as soon as you wake up, it's a start to a whole new day, mm-hmm. and you don't dwell on what you what what happened the day yeah. before. I seen a quote that said, "Yesterday don't care about you because it's gone already." <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> You know, so it's like, why dwell on the past when you still have to create your future? You know, it's like, so when we sit there and think about, man, yesterday was bad. You've already failed that day because you're thinking about yesterday. I don't wake up in the morning thinking that anything about yesterday because I wake up in the morning like, man, today is a new day. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. And I have a whole nother 24 hours. To, <laughs> to be <laughs> to be a I'm that guy who's like when you know something's gonna happen but you let it happen anyways facts so look but I wake up every day knowing that I have another opportunity to be a better version of myself and you know I think that for all of everyone is that when you can focus on that of working on just being a better version, it goes back to growth, you know, then you do have the grit mm-hmm. and you do find your purpose because your vision is clear. It's not that you're you're having setbacks. You don't you don't, you know like people always say like man, sometimes it's good to reflect, but it's also good to reflect in order to grow. Right. Yeah. And see, I think like the thing about it like just cultivating the vision is easy, but how do you instill the habit to reach that vision? The plan. Execution. You know, like, yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Sometimes people have these big visions, but they don't even know the approach yeah. of how to make it possible. Yeah. So it's like, and then their parents, they're like, I don't know. Right? Like, they're so used <laughs> to it. got hard. They ain't got nothing yeah. for you. So yeah. what they're doing. Well, yeah. So it's like, how do you shake up that comfort zone mm-hmm. and you instill a new way to approach that vision? Well, that's what, know? I mean, but that's what you just, I mean, you just said it. You know, you said some people People have a big vision and they don't know how to reach it. But when you got a daily vision, mm-hmm. but it's cute, it's cute today. It's, it's a lot more accountability. It's like, damn, okay, I got 24 hours to get up and go do this, yeah. versus I got all year to to go figure this out. You really ain't got 24 hours. hours. You really ain't even got that, right? <laughs> I think I think what you're saying is there's a good point to that because that that book also talks about why people fail is because they don't plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I. I don't. I have a vision because I have people that I want to strive to be like and mm-hmm. achieve some of the things that mm-hmm. they've achieved. But I want to do it my way. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna, you know, come up with a plan all by myself. I'm gonna try to figure out who are the successful people. What are their what what can I take from their experiences and what they've done, and how can I apply that to my my own life? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that goes with leadership. That goes with not just us doing that there's someone out there that is going to look up to us break break that down more like do you invite people out for coffee do you mm-hmm. set up a skype once a week like am, what do you do to i am not afraid and it, it goes back to my word purpose i am not afraid of meeting clearly or doing anything <laughs> i'm gonna show up <laughs> hey, i'm just gonna show, show up, show up. Yeah. i'm but, just gonna show up and but that's our job like yeah, we, right we randomly show up at different places every single day and meet yeah. New, people new people every single so day. So even to that point with the Greek picnic and stuff I do, I got a sponsor just showing up to an event last week. Like, was just at the event. I ended up winning a prize, telling her about what I do. And she was like, hey, I want to sponsor you. Like, just off just, of that. Just, just off showing up. Just off of being there. Let's, I, I don't know how we'll work through this fun by the way through, but I'm interested to know more about what you were talking about with Stan. Um, but but maybe from the viewpoint of how were you approached? Or how do you remember being approached? Was it through someone directly that was outside of the community? Was it someone in the school brought the opportunity? Like, how were you approached? And then, like, why did you take it? Were you forced to take it? Did something in your gut say, I should take this? Like, those two things. Man, okay, cool. So you asked a serious question. Um... I'm going to have fun with it. I did not want to do it. It's my <laughs> uncle. That's, that's why I'm asking. Because nah. that's how we started uh, this was like, you know, yeah, exactly. No, honestly, though, it was my uncle's camp. So I was kind of forced to do it. It wasn't something that I was interested in doing because I'm a high school kid. It's in the middle of the summer. All I'm really thinking about is having fun, hanging out with friends, just mm-hmm. just being a high school 
young man. Right, so right, right. it wasn't nothing necessarily that I was very interested in. I really hated waking up early in the morning just to go do it. So mm-hmm. back when I had to join the camp and had to be one of the guinea pigs to do it, it, it wasn't nothing I was interested mm-hmm. in. I started, it's, it's a, a lot of what I started to understand was when I turned 18 afterwards, when I actually got thrown into that real world, when I when I became this personal chef. So all of it began to make sense of what I went through for those four years every summer, mm-hmm. and it all played out fine. So, you know, like I said, how to wear a suit, how to tie a tie, mm-hmm. how to count my money, how to balance my money, and it's been working. So mm-hmm. very grateful that I end up accepting it. It was like a, a slap in the face. Right, right, right. Mm. That was me, because that was a part, point I was thinking about a lot in our, in our show today was like, we, we sometimes we may know what's best for people, but like how do we bridge that gap of like getting them and take those opportunities? Um, I'm curious, man. One of the other things we talked a lot about was essentially like being like a unicorn in whatever you're doing, right? Like a few people talked about that, man. And and so ha- did anything from there transfer into like, I mean, you were a young black chef, man. And you for real chef, you know what I mean? Like you're a unicorn in your space, man. Ain't, ain't too many 22 year old executive chefs really getting down like that. Right. Like, what are some of the things that you feel like transferred from trying to develop yourself to actually, like, play out in being a chef in your world? Uh, Rushing the process was one of them. Uh, That was something that I always tried to do. Like, I wanted to rush getting football players. I wanted to rush getting more business. Uh, But it wasn't something, you know, that I was was actually ready to do. You know, I wanted to raise my prices high because I wanted to make money. I wanted to be able to make a living. I didn't want to work for anybody. So it's, it was about balance for me to become a unicorn. How can you, you know, keep this job, you know, stay in school while still trying to produce, become an amazing personal chef? So I say learning my balance and, and, and trust and, and not rushing a lot actually mm-hmm. end up, mm-hmm. that, that's how it kind of played out for me. Because um, a lot of what I've done, you know, just being young and in this generation, I, I didn't really listen to people at first, you know. So being a much younger person, you know, and I, I was listening to a lot of what they were saying, you know, it's hard to kind of communicate with kids. He said it's hard to kind of fill in those gaps. So it's all about, I feel like, pushing, just pushing them out, mm-hmm. you know, into that sea and kind of just mm-hmm. having to go with the flow. Mm-hmm. All right, so let me just hit this real quick. It goes back to what Ryan said, perspective, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because when, for one, we have so many closed-minded people mm-hmm. that they don't allow new people to come into their lives. Mm-hmm. One thing that me and Ryan do every day is that 5.30 a.m. wake-up call. Mm-hmm. But it's a group of people that's given us a different perspective on the same topic. So we're able to have an open mind to say, okay, this is my be the way I've seen something. But, mm-hmm. but now I'm taking it and listening to somebody else. And I'm maybe I need to kind of do it. Exactly. Yeah, and I yeah. think that, you know, just like how they were saying, like you, when you meet somebody, that conversation, you could be seeing something in one view. Right, and then they, they them put you on a whole nother right, pedestal. Right, right. And you're like, dang, I didn't even think about it like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, my God. That makes, me, that makes me that makes me that makes me think about how many people are closed minded when we say most oh my god okay this is going to be amazing for me it was amazing for me but um, for, for me first um what's so amazing is uh, how we let other people's perceptions dictate our life without experience mm-hmm. right and without questioning Right. So, right. Like, listen to this, man. Like, so what if life is like the dentist? Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll hear how life, how painful life is, man. Life going to chew you up, spit you out. Life hard. Right. So most people like, man, I ain't trying to go through that. Right. Same way with the dentist. Right. Like, man, the (laughs) dentist is painful, dog. I don't I don't want to go through that. So and so said, man, that grinding of all the what the dentist does I, don't, I ain't trying to go through that right so we grow up fearing the dentist the doctor and anything right instead of going because it'll save our life mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and so we'll we'll look at their perception of the dentist and say man it, it got to be painful for me too mm-hmm. and not understanding your pain tolerance mm-hmm. could be totally different right. than theirs they might be on a two <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? right but you on a 10 right you build different yeah. when other people fold you cope Right? You just drop tears where everybody else is like, Dennis, can you stop, dog? Mm-hmm. 
I need a break. You just like, I'm gonna drop tears, but keep going. Right? Because right? I need the reward. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So most of us are saying, you know what? Instead of going through that painful dentist operation, just give me the comfort. Put me to sleep. Put me to sleep. And then hopefully when I wake up, you didn't did all the work because I don't want to go through the pain. But I think for like going back to Perfect. education that hits and like right there. how you draw that out of these kids. So every single day I ask my clients, what's important to you? Because if you go deeper to mm -hmm. what's important to them and you're getting to know them, then you have something to go back to and say, if this is truly important mm -hmm. to you, if this is truly where you do want to be or you don't want to be, then maybe you can actually dig deeper and help them to mm -hmm. get to point, that next point level. Point of reference. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. But I even think, in, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was saying, well, I think it goes to like actually cultivating your why. Yep. That's mm -hmm. pretty much Simon pretty Sinek. Much doing. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so that's like, like, why, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's why. It's right yeah. there behind your head. I was getting yeah. into it this week a little bit. I think what helps people um, find their why, to kind of touch on what Brittany said, um, you kind of have to kill that learning curve for them. And I think not so much to transform them, but to show them, again, the transition, mm -hmm. right? And so in the transition for me is, is helping them understand that it's in what you didn't have mm -hmm. that helps build you to who you should be. Right. Right. If we got all the nurturing, right. If we got all the nurturing, cuddling, mm -hmm. like all of those things, how weak would it make you? Mm -hmm. right. how, if, if you went through life where your whole family was a crutch for you, mm -hmm. how would you be able to experience everything? Like moms are some of the worst. We love them to death, but moms are some of the worst. Right. As soon as you hurt yourself, scrape your knee or anything, they're trying to hurry up. Baby, you OK? Put a Band-Aid on it. Right. So anytime he get hurt, he's screaming out, Mom, right. instead of understanding. Yeah. All I got to do is put a little dirt on it, wipe it off, <laughs> keep going. Keep Just keep moving. Moving, right yeah. and so we we always our families sometimes are our biggest crush of course they love us but love sometimes isn't always the best right, right? right, right. because sometimes the pain is meant mm -hmm. like I look at my man right here and it's like he invites pain mm -hmm. and keeps going anyway mm -hmm. right so how how much does that say to us us that have the ability to walk and do everything that he can't that he doesn't wish to do at all mm -hmm. Right. To be in the position of saying, how can I in my life and invite that kind of pain? Right. right? To still be able to persevere. But I, th I think a big part of it is, you know, we all throw a bucket in the middle of us and throw in your worst problem, your worst pain, your worst fear, whatever. Would you pull yours back out? Because you have to look at everyone else's perspective mm -hmm. and everyone has excuses. Everyone mm -hmm. has problems. Everyone has defeat that they mm -hmm. go through. And you really have to see your own perspective and say, would I, would I take mine back? Would I choose mine over and over again because other people are going through the same thing? Right. Right, right, right. I would absolutely choose it every time. Yeah, mm -hmm. Because exactly. it, when we go through it, that's the only way we can then right. create impact. Mm -hmm. Through struggle, that's how we find our strength. Right. And, you know, just I want to give like a real like personal experience, you know, um, even though the dentist was one too, like that was that. I'm telling you, I didn't, I didn't want. <laughs> I, hey man, I'll tell you, I never want to go to the dentist because I'm like, man, that's gonna hurt, you know. But <clears throat> say when I got paralyzed, you know, um, man, I had three years of the hardest, hardest time trying to overcome it because my mindset was built on somebody else's perspective of what being disabled was supposed to be. Mm. I literally sunk into depression because the vision that I had was the only vision that I seen everybody else had, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and the way I was able to overcome it was because I was at my lowest, you know, I was able to say, okay, <clears throat> if I want something, I got to want it for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> only way I was going to be able to change was doing it for myself at that point. I didn't look at anybody else and I didn't look at anybody's perspective, but at those first three years, it was like, man. Break that down more, man. And I like the idea of they're saying, like, you can either go like a year at a time or like if you can reflect on it 12 weeks throughout each year, like, how did you actually lift yourself man, out of that? It was, it, was, it was that I was defeated. You know, like, you got to understand what defeat is in your own mind. You know, is it being broke? Is it being uh, dealing with pain? You know, is it, is it, feeling like nothing and I felt like nothing. I felt like as soon as I became paralyzed, my life was over. I didn't I didn't see opportunity. You know, I was 
I mean, I was big, but I was good big walking, you know, but I, you know, as I got, when I got paralyzed, it brought complications, but it only brought complications because I, I, I allowed it to. My mind said, you know how some people say that, you know, you can be sick, but it's the way your mind is set on that sickness that's either going to make you sicker or it's going to help you heal. And for me, I was mentally sick of myself. I couldn't see myself in the position that I was in. And what, ha- what I was able to do was, man, like, is, is I embraced it. Once I was able to say, man, it, it's not that bad. It, man, what? The, the embracing the choices. Choice. Like, what are the choices you made in embracing that, man, day to day? Like, what things did you take on that you would have turned away from? Or what things did you deal with? Or? I mean, the, the main thing that I did to in, in order to embrace it was that, you know, I, th- I did the unthinkable in my mind. And I was, I, I ended up going to school. I started learning about nutrition. I started eating healthy, man. I never ate healthy. I never worked out, you know. And to me, that was where steps. It's like you have to, I got uncomfortable. You know, we always hear that, like, you can't be comfortable unless you're uncomfortable, <laughs> you know. And, and so I was comfortable soaking in depression. I was comfortable uh, using everybody else as a crutch. You know, like I had my mom come in to cook, clean, even take my daughter's bath, like all this because I was just, I, I wanted that crutch, you know. And, and instead, I would just lay in the bed every day and dwell on life. Well, then I had to get to that point and said, man, I got to get uncomfortable. And the only way I can get uncomfortable was trying to do better for myself. Because I believe that, like, it's like your story, it evokes, like, mm-hmm. two mindsets, settling or growth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You can either be on those two. Like, it's the same way with development. When we're growing up and we're going through our puberty and we're going through all that, we're growing. It's like we're in that mm-hmm. stage, that process of growth. Then we reach that plateau to the point where we settle. Mm-hmm. This is as far as we can develop. But then it goes beyond the mind, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, what stage are you in in that process of developing? Are you mm-hmm. in that growth phase mm-hmm. or are you plateaued and settling, mm-hmm. you know? And I believe that that, like, at what point do you hit that point where it's like you, like, at your low and you don't want to settle, so you end up training and condition yourself to grow, right. like, which, which ultimately takes you out of your comfort zone mm-hmm. right. and yeah, takes know. you to new heights as far as mentally. So to, it's like, to, to I don't know. combat that, I think, the universe has a funny way, I mean, including ourselves, uh, we have a funny way of throwing things out because our spirit knows the potential of us, mm. right? Like, and so when depression sets in or, or sadness or anything like that, I feel like that's the spirit telling you you're not living up mm. to that, yeah. right? Mm. And so we always mm. get put in situations to change it, mm. right? but it's a pass or fail. Do we accept the test or not, right? right? And most of us run away from that, mm-hmm. right? And it delays the process. Right, right, right. It always delays the process, right? right, right. So it, I, I think it's more so about getting these kids, again, like we said in another episode, to, to celebrate failure, mm-hmm. right? We, we must teach them to celebrate that mm-hmm. right. because- Because it's guaranteed. Like, right. It, it, you, you can't, if you, you're trying to be successful, Okay, let's, it's time to fail. <laughs> we gotta go fail or something. And, let's go and, fail. And then get back let's up. hurry up. Yes. Yeah, see, see it in full circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then exactly. learn from that. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. And learn from that. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for those that like actively um, put themselves in situations to like be uncomfortable, um, if, if any of you do that, like how do you do that? And what do you do when you feel that uncomfort? I'm in the gym every day. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> Bro, it's I'm uncomfortable in the, being It's uncomfortable being in the gym paralyzed. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, so that's, that's, that's my main goal. Like, I'm there seven days a week because I love the fact of being uncomfortable. I read. Just I read constantly. Mm. I didn't read books when I grew up. You know what I mean? Like, that's putting me out of my comfort zone of just saying, man, I could just watch TV. Right. I could just, Passive. you know, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and so those are some of the steps. Like, mm. I know that being uncomfortable in the gym is only going to make me stronger, right? Right, right? But it's not doing it just physically, it's doing it mentally. Man, I just I just showed him something talking about that. The, like, there's, there's something attached to it. Like, when you work out your body, it's a natural trainer of your mind that you, you feel the recognizing that, that discomfort as a, as a part of life. Yeah, I don't know, you, you made me think of something, man, which was like, that feeling that discomfort, that frustration, like that. A lot, there's a lot of people that go through life never feeling uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. 
you know? No, because they, 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 they love being comfortable. Right. It's a quote that I just looked at, man. It said, creators come. I mean, we'll, 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 we'll get a comfortable bed. Comfortable yeah. couch. Right, right, right. Comfortable seats. <laughs> right. right? We uh, seek we comfort. Love, yeah, yeah. We, we got to get the heated seats. Yeah. Right? We got to go as far as getting the heated steering wheel. Yeah. Right? Just Every Everything's comfort, push, bro. Push yeah. Yeah. Every, push everything's comfort. Convenience, it, convenience. It, it, convenience and comfort is yeah. what we are built on. So it's almost is like... Is it human nature? It's if, if we know the... If we'll say the government is training people in the mental stimulation, right? This is stimulating people to be comfortable and weak and passive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Creators become comfortable when being uncomfortable. Yeah. If I, I'm at this point now, and I'm trying to consistently reflect and figure out how I got here. But if I'm not <laughs> uncomfortable on a day-to-day -day basis, I know something's wrong. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I know, I've just got, and it's almost a thing that you've gotten used to. You're just like, okay, this is how I know. It's like one of the checks in your mind, like, I know I'm moving forward. But I can't remember, like what made me get to that point in life, like where I knew that I needed to be uncomfortable and that I knew that that was the right place to be. I think you just have to tell yourself, fall in love with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because- so Accept it as a fact. Yeah. Accept yeah. it, yeah. accept yeah. it. Because unless you accept that, you're not only not growing, but you're probably falling behind. Mm -hmm. And when everybody else is, is comfortable with being comfortable, why would you want to do the same thing? Right, right. You want to live your life differently and do things differently and be someone different because if you fall into the same thing, everybody else is not in that growing mindset. Jay got on this topic on one of our episodes and I'm curious if you thought that having that mindset and, and but being around a community of people, a society of people that push against that, do you feel, have, have you ever felt ostracized in that space or um, for always for trying to achieve more, has that worked against you in a community of people? Or Can you ask that differently? Like, has has trying to achieve more worked against you in a group of people? I think I think the way Jay put it is like people like I don't remember the exact word he used, but people essentially like bash you for being different, for trying to achieve more. Like in in school, like oh. you didn't you didn't you didn't nerd it. If you if you show up every day, you work your ass off. You you would nerd. You, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Anybody that's trying to divide the something like, different, they always gonna stand out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but but why why do you think it is that that person is often ostracized for who for what they're trying to do? Because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Like, like they recognize the, their own discomfort. Yeah. It's like some. It's a, it's a, it's like um, a person that smokes cigarettes is only gonna like a person and want to hang out with a person that smokes cigarettes, right. even if they hung out with each other for a long time. The guy, again, we talk about it all the time. The guy that decides to That's quit smoking guy. cigarettes, he got to get away from the guy. He got to get away from him, right? And right. he'll hit him up like, "Hey, dog, you still smoking cigarettes, man?" Right. Like, and he can't hang around him anymore, right? The guy that's still smoking, right? Because he's like, man, mm -hmm. homie's changing his life. He's changing his. Yeah. His features look different. His skin is looking different. Man, I can't be around him because he's making me consciously aware that I'm choosing to sit in this. One of the biggest things for me lately has been surrounding myself with the right people. Mm -hmm. But not just that, but leaving the people that I shouldn't be around, that are just by, by way of life put us together as we aged, right? Like, ha have any of you gone through that where you've actively tried to separate yourself from people um, and realign yourself with a different group. Let me let me hit this just pretty hard, man. I, I feel no, like I. I, I feel like we hey, hey. Every time I'm like, no, no, it's so, <laughs> I'm about to beat him up. I'm about to beat up this topic. <laughs> no, man. Like to me, honestly, I think I have more of uh, uh, some power in this conversation just because, like, we talk about being uncomfortable. We talk about you know, um, being different, you know, like I get, I get to embrace that every day. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, everyone else has to figure out how to be uncomfortable when I wake up every morning being uncomfortable. So there's nothing you can do. So about. there's nothing else that I can do besides be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, and once I embrace this, mm -hmm. then I can, I can say, okay, I'm uncomfortable every day because I've allowed that I've embraced it. Mm -hmm. So that means if I got to read, that means if I gotta do, you know, get in front of a camera, doing something different, I can embrace it and, and go all out because reality has set in. And I think that some people just don't have, you have to figure out what's your daily, what's the daily thing that's gonna make you uncomfortable. Sometimes it's someone's flaws and it's like, you gotta figure out what your flaw is, that you know is your flaw. Everybody has a flaw, right. you know, but 
once you can embrace that flaw every day, that's that's your that's your key to success. That's eight mile, right now. That's that's Eminem all all the way eight mile, right? Okay, think about think about the movie. At the beginning of the movie, he 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 had aspirations of rapping. He knew he could probably beat everybody, right? But he did not accept his environment, the things that he went through, the, his circumstances, right? So when he went up there to rap, he was thinking about his circumstance instead of his gift, right? So when it was his time, he didn't do anything, right? Until he was willing to go through the process of accepting, right? So then when he got his opportunity, before they could talk about it, he talked about his own experience, so then it left him, the guy he was rapping against, in the very situation that he was in. He couldn't do because then he had it's no all power. On the table. It's gone, yeah. right? So once we accept our flaws, right, and be able to then tell our story within our flaws, right, mm -hmm. that's the power. Mm -hmm. What makes vulnerability so difficult? It's like, uncomfortable. <laughs> like trees with leaves. Right, right. We, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sign, sign of weakness. weakness. It's a yeah. sign of weakness. And, yeah. and the world doesn't favor weakness or no. what? Man, I, I got a metaphor. We like trees with leaves. <laughs> I was not expecting that. What do you mean? <laughs> you don't want to look at a bare tree. And... Bare trees look ugly, mm -hmm. right? Bare trees look mm -hmm. like they're dead, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but vulnerability is something that you can't put on. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't just become vulnerable. You can't just be vulnerable. It's something that you you rip That's away definitely. things and you just step right. fully into it. You mm -hmm. become that. Mm -hmm. It's not something that because most of us go out of our way to create the habit of not showing who we truly are. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll experience hurt at a young age. Really right. Are really experience some traumatic things, right? And instead of dealing with those things or being around people that teach us how to deal with things, we've learned how to do it or, or cope in a negative way. And then that becomes the habit so long that we forgot the very thing that started that process, right? right, right. right? So then by the time that we're like ready to like really do some things, we got to go back to the age of six. 20, 20 years, gotta back to we got to go back to six before we start the process. <laughs> of getting out, right? Because we got to know the process that we took to get in is going to take that same amount of time mm. to get out. Mm. Either way, time's going to pass. Right? right, that's the biggest yeah. thing I've had to realize lately. It's like, either way, the it's days... It's going to come. The day, right. <laughs> or it's not. I'm going to be 30 then... eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to think about trying to do this stuff tomorrow, too? Man, mm -hmm. that's why, I, man, Jay, we were... We were, to give like a really small backstory of this, I was trying to figure out, like, well, how are we going to do this? We could put this together. And Jay was like, we're starting tomorrow. <laughs> and <I was> like, <laughs> there you go. I was like, yeah. and, and, and it was so weird. Oh, man, it was oh, so yeah. weird. I mean, it was just me and Pat Rob. <laughs> but it got better and better. And, you know what I mean? But it's, but you just you just got to just jump in. Man. And one of the things that's been huge for me is like building community. You know, that's why I truly try to express to you all, to everyone that's been on, to the larger group of people, is like building community. Like as you as you think about your work, like how do you how do you try to build your community? Mm. I think for me, it's it's never about me. Mm -hmm. um, I can't approach a situation based on the me. It's got to be on how can I, what can I learn from you, mm -hmm. and how can I help you get just a little bit closer to whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Whether that's me personally helping you or introducing you to someone. That's what that's what mm -hmm. I love doing is I know I can't fix this world. I, I know that. I can do my part, but I know that there is someone in this community, there is someone in my group of people, there is someone that I have come and, and cross paths with, with that you should meet. You should just know. You guys should, and I don't have to be involved, but you should just figure it out because there's something special. I mean, we did that. Right, right, right. I mean, that's how we met. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. That's how we all here today. Yeah. yeah. That's the beautiful thing about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that goes back to kind of like when we had this conversation before we started this, and I, I would tell him that I wake up every morning trying to, I wake up every morning with the thought of how I can bring value to someone else's life. Mm -hmm. Like, my life is... Hit him with the goggles, bro. Hit <laughs> him with him. He said, what? Knock him out. Pat Rob ready in the, he's in the so, batter's box. You know, it's, it's yeah. like, you know, I don't never think about myself. And I think when you have that mindset and you can get how, there. How have, that's what I was going to say. How have, you, how have you proven for that to also help you? Because I, I think a lot of people, maybe they truly want to, you know, but they just mathematically, right, they're doing the math in their head and they're like, how, how am I, how right, is look, this going to? This is real. 
I lived, I was, for 24 years of my life, I say 26, I was negative, right? Like, I, I just had this negative mindset because I always cared about myself. It was the moment that I started to care about other people that I felt good. And I wasn't going to go back because caring about someone else makes you feel good and inside. And then it, it, it became where I started to build that foundation on that. Like, I feel so good about helping other people that I, I can't go back to just yeah. thinking about myself. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that when people start to see the, the, the mm-hmm. benefit. Yeah. Right. But you got to make, I mean, make that leap first. Yeah. And I think that that's the hardest thing. Because anyone who has started, who has truly turned their life to giving, he, I've never heard anyone say, I tried that and didn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't, ever. but I mean, even though people have been hurt, right? And like you, you, and I think we are, those that are in the classroom, like I'm going through this right now where you give so much yeah. and they t- you feel like they're taking none of it. We're like, man, I'm out. <laughs> I didn't even and the show crazy up part tomorrow. is they, they are taking some of it in. It's just not to the capacity of where you want them where, to where be. you really and so that's when you get lost where you're trying to push them too far and that's not you know you, you have to you kind of got to know their limitations yeah. too yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But that's the point that i wanted to kind of touch on bro like the fact that you know sometimes you said like you end up basically being in a position where i think it alternates you know what i'm saying sometimes you be in that position where you know like i want to be selfish or, or it's like, I started off as I wanted to give, give, give. I was giving, giving, giving. Everybody started winning and I started losing everything because I was giving everything of the little things that I had. And then it's like, I got to a bad position. I'm like, nah, bro, I got to end up basically taking that. Mm-hmm. So I became more selfish. Yeah. Be, like, and just, it means I'm trying to get my mind right, my, my platform right. So yeah. now I could transition, alternate that yeah. to giving, 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 because I know that the more I give, that's networking. Like the law of reciprocity is going to say, people are going to give to me later on down the line. Right, so right. So it's an alternating of what selfish gains do you have, but at the same time, what selfish gains do other people have to yeah. help them meet that opportunity. Right. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Because that's what you really want to know. You want to know people's deepest desires. Yeah. yeah. And you, you made me think about a, a thing, something that happened too. I mean, just in my life as far as everything too, but also it came to a point where I gave so much and I couldn't give either, you know, to other people. So at that point, I was no help to them. Yeah. So it almost had to be to a point where you had to find that balance to make sure you have enough for self in order to give off. Because I noticed with the days that I was didn't have enough or I, to give to myself, I was that was my bad days. Those are the ones where I was like, hey, don't nobody talk to me. Hey y'all, hey y'all, hey kids, hey you going home today? Like for real. Well, it's yeah. like just like like they tell you when you're on an airplane and there's a kid sitting next to you. You're supposed to put your air mask on first you, if right. the plane's going right. down because right. if you can't breathe, you can't help this yeah. kid yeah. breathe mm-hmm. next to you. And so it was funny because I was actually traveling for work and. I looked at these questions on how to get to know yourself. So I was going through it and it asked me, what makes you happy? Mm-hmm. And I kept writing these things down and then I read back through the list and it was all about giving mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. other people. Mm-hmm. And so that made me happy. But then I was like, well, I have to take also time for myself mm-hmm. or do stuff to yeah. give me life mm-hmm. and energy yeah. as well. Because if not, I cannot then Can't reciprocate that. Yeah. I think we always confuse the giving with um, not, a, not asking in return. Mm. And something that I've learned mm. is I love to give, but mm. it's also okay for me to ask you, right. Hey, this is what I need. Right. Now the catch is I'm right. not expecting mm-hmm. you to give me that, but I need to, I need to tell you what it is that I need from you as well. Talking to your your 16 year old self, you may give the same answer, but but what I'm what I'm more curious in you doing is like looking directly into one of maybe that one right there is making that really intense. Um, yeah, what would you tell your 16 year old self? Um, I would tell my 16 year old self. I will actually apologize uh, to my 16 year old self for being so closed minded, being uh, such a disrespectful kid. You know, growing up, uh, not not believing in myself, you know, having a lot of insecurities. Um, I would apologize to myself for um, staying in depressions. Um, it's, it's a lot of apologies that I would give my 16-year-old self 
just because I don't feel like I, I reached my full potential and I had everything around me. I had all of the right people, you know, a guy like Stan, you know, a guy like my uncle, you know, people like Wes, you know, I just met him, but it's, it's a lot of inspiring people that's been around me for a long time. So I would definitely, I will apologize to my 16 year old self because I didn't, if I was 16 with this mindset right now, I promise you I'll be able to see you. Man, if, if we all say, if I knew then what I know now, man, man. right, right, If right. I started two years earlier with the same, and, and I started becoming a personal chef. That's when mm -hmm. I got into classically yeah. training. But if I would have had that mindset at 16 mm -hmm. instead of waiting to 18. Right, it'd be different. As a chef, is there anything you love to cook, anything you hate to cook? Uh, vegan food. <laughs> Did he leave already? Uh, he's over there. Okay. Um, <laughs> I feel sorry for you. No, um, no, it's not. It's not any food that I don't like to cook. I love keeping myself open. I don't have a target market. I can cook paleo food. I can cook vegan food. Uh, barbecue. I can cook Chinese food. Um, so. I don't feel like you should ever limit yourself. In certain areas, in certain career fields, yes, limit yourself to a target market, but with me being a personal chef, I will never limit my target market. What about cooking? What aspects of cooking have like played out in like your real life? Like, What are principles behind like cooking and trying to become a better chef that you think could matter to a whole lot of people's lives. Elaborate on that a little bit more. Like, like what, um, what are the practices of cooking? Right? Like, what are the things you have to intentionally do when you're cooking that you feel like are just life principles in general? Mm. Oh, time. Time management is definitely one. Uh, balance is another one. To be able to balance all of these different events, uh, different things that you got going on. Like, if I got chicken on the stove, I got something in the oven, got to have balance. How are you going to be able to move around that? Uh, patience is another one. Uh, patience with my employees. You know, I can't just snap on them if they do something wrong. I can't do that. That's pretty much it. Bro, each time, bro, I'll be blown. I'll be excited just to see, like, one week when I come around the corner and break for the food, I'll be like a little kid. Like, because I, I know, I know you're going to throw down, man. A question that I wish people asked me more often. A real question, uh, would you like to come to L.A. to cook for me? <laughs> That, would, that wouldn't hurt if some people started asking them. Uh, no, honestly, a real question that I would like people to ask me, um, why do you continue to cook on a daily basis? Because um, if you guys, what a lot of you guys don't know, if y'all see me now, y'all see this happy young kid, you know, that's, that just loves doing what he's doing. I love doing what I'm doing. But when I'm actually at work, you know, I'm one of the most stressed out people there is. You know, it's not necessarily an attitude that's, it's on my face, but like I'm often angry because of a lot of things that's just going on in my life. And so I'm still learning balance, you know, so I'm not a perfect guy out here. I'm not a perfect chef. So it's, it's helping me realize all of the areas that I need to improve on myself on. So definitely uh, the question I wish people would ask me is, why do you continue to cook? Mm. You know, because it could be very stressful. Uh, I worked in some of the worst conditions ever. Um, I've been treated, you know, disrespectfully. Uh, I didn't even have somebody, you know, not even want to eat my food just because I was a black kid, you know, and that's when I worked in a, a restaurant. So, you know, why do I continue to do what I do? And I'm going to answer that question. It's because I love it. It's what I stand for. Um, when I didn't, you know, when my mom was at school, you know, this is what I had to do to survive by myself at home as a young eight-year-old. Um, so it's just about the passion. It, it, it was, it, it is what keeps me going. It's, it's what motivates me. It what makes me happy. And just being able to connect with so many people and to be able to inspire so many people with just my wrist motions, <laughs> the wrist motions, the Great. food. It's, it's probably been one of the greatest feelings in the world. You know, it's better than my first love. Like. Dang. This right here, making but for real, you know, <laughs> making you smile, making you smile, making you smile, making you smile, making you smile. You cannot get that, you know, just from just normal people. This is something that I do for a living, and I can make countless number of people happy. So, I'm gonna we'll, I'm gonna ask a selfish question to wrap mm -hmm. it up, man. Um, what what have you seen? as someone who's kind of almost watched the show from a distance, mm -hmm. engaging, watching it, like, what have you seen us do over the nine weeks we've been doing this? What have I seen? Uh, I've seen a lot of networking. I've definitely seen a lot of networking, a lot of knowledge being taken in from different people. 
Um, and I've met a lot. This show here has brought me to meet a lot of people, man. Uh, educators, you know, athletes, former athletes, uh, just a lot. So I definitely see a lot of networking, a lot of building that's going on. Um, and shit. Ooh, almost cuss. <laughs> Most of these uh, people, you know, that's actually been here wants to do want, want to do business with me too. So it's it's also another it's it's a great feeling because being around a room with so many innovators, educators, uh, former athletes, um, and, and well, how 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 you just say this? How you say this? Motivators. Yes, there we go. I was gonna try to think of a cool word, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> but just being around all of these people, uh, I just think it's a lot of. A love magic being made. Yeah, yeah it's happening. A lot of magic happening. So. The magic is happening. Yeah, it, it, it's good. Seth Shessons, where we sit it down and chop it up with Chef J. Pow. One of the yeah. biggest lessons I learned. My first, I went into fundraising when I was when I was first got out of college, <laughs> and you learn so much about the way the world works when you like go deep into fundraising. And a mentor of mine who told me like, he said 90% of the time people don't give because people don't ask. Mm -hmm. And and then it was probably maybe like less than a year later. I'm sitting around. It was an African American luncheon, and the president at the time of Lincoln, the HBCU in Missouri. Oh, nice. We're sitting around this table together and Dr. Roman and, and so I'm like asking him like fact checking what my other minister told me about fundraising <clears throat> and I said just if you wouldn't mind tell me how how you've raised money for the school and he said I'll be completely honest with you he said we're well, sitting around a table just like this and I knew the guy had the money so I leaned back and I said now you're gonna give me that million dollars right and he got the check and I'm like god damn so I, <laughs> so I tried it so I tried it, right? Like, just like you said, like, present, like, give value, right? Like, show some way of, like, giving and, like, of caring and of being, in, and being intentional and then ask, yeah. right? And then they're like, well, you've done so much for me. Mm -hmm. That's the least I can do, mm -hmm. you know? And, like, being, but oftentimes I realize, like, even one of two things, right? The ask, like, the, the failure of, like, not getting what you ask for, mm -hmm. yeah. like, putting yourself out there and being like, it's going to go totally, totally wrong or not knowing exactly what to ask right. for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, then, that's been Then the you go thing. back into your vision. Because before you can make that ask, you gotta know if he asks, if I ask him for this, he's gonna ask me why, why? Right. or what do you need it for? Right. So then you have to be ready to give so that 15 minute. That. Cause nine still, times out of 10, we gonna say, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Really I want, uh, I want and it, it. And, you, and it, it matters the way you say it. Yeah. If you say it just, let me let me read you what it is. Yeah, but if yeah. you say it and you believe it and you have passion, you have conviction, yeah. right. that's a whole different yeah. ballgame. So, so for me, I, I this is something that I feel like I, I stress like a lot. I stress it with um, my athletes that I train. And, you know, I tell them that everything that comes out your mouth needs to come out with confidence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's the way that people feed into you. Like. One of the things that I found, even being a speaker, is that when I don't go with a script, yeah. like I might get in the shower and practice some stuff, you know, <laughs> like, but everything that I practice never comes out when I get yeah, in front of that you audience. Just, you're just, you're just but I'm just yeah. building that confidence to right. be in front of a group of people. Right. And, and I feel that once you can, when you, like you said, like when you start to believe it, you know, then everybody else believes what you're they, saying. They can tell you believe what you're talking about. But if you about. start to, if you doubt yourself, people can, people that feel that doubt. The energy of doubt. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like you have to come at people, before you open your mouth, you have to be confident about everything that you say, no matter what. Like, don't put yourself in that position if you're not confident. If you want to right. ask for something, right. then you got to be confident to ask. Yeah. You got to be ready for it. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's the, the main goal is like confidence. Yeah. You know, like if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to have confidence in what you say. Right. To take that one step further too, though, you also can't let the fear of rejection and mm -hmm. the fear of no get in the way of asking because I think that's why people don't ask is, right. well, this person, you know, they're, it's they're probably not, busy anyway. It's yeah. not going to work. And yeah, it's yeah. like, what does it matter? The right. worst that could happen is, and it's easier said than done. Don't get way, me wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's Perception. way easier yeah. said than done. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but when you're, when you're truly passionate about something and you can share it mm -hmm. and not fear yeah. what everyone else is going to say or even if they laugh at you right. or whatever, then there's there's no losing at Let that point. Let me ask point. you something, and it may not be this binary, but do you think we spend our lives building passion or revealing passion? Like, do you, by that I mean, do you feel like you were born with something, right, that you spend your whole life trying to reveal? 
or do you think that you go through circumstances and build whatever you're passionate about? I think it's building, like, I think it's revealing because with the revealing, it builds. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think that that's what people gravitate to. You know, they're inspired by what you're revealing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that, I think it's more of that. Peeling peeling back the layers. Man, I ask myself, like, did I care? Like, when I was six, right? (laughs) Like, did some part of me care about the same things I care about now? And I've matured into it? Mm -hmm. And it's always been there? Mm -hmm. Or, Or have I, based on circumstance? No. Everything you already, everything that you already know, grew, grew to know, uh, will know later on, will grow to know, is already within. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a source of abundance, right? And we all have that source within us, not in this, but in our spirit. So it's already there. We just have to train ourselves to go get access. Well, it's just, it's just like that mind. It's just the mind, you know. You gotta think about it, man. Like for me to live my life as negative as I did, and I'm 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 proud to speak on it because I know who I am today. Mm-hmm. But you have those two mindsets, right? Every day, every decision that you make, it's either gonna say, all right, you know, you got this first mind and you got that second mind. And normally we listen to the second mind because it sounds better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the first first mind is like you're tackling fear, mm-hmm. right? The first mind is like, go for it. Who cares if they yeah. say no? Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the second one, like, man, don't do it because they're going to say no. <laughs> right? You already know they're going to say no, so why we even? But, you know, this is one thing I teach my daughter is that you don't know yeah. what they're going to really, say. Really, yeah, really. And, it's all, it's all and for me, it's like I've realized that I've broke so many barriers by going with that first mind. Like, mm-hmm. I listen to my first. I've drove around, and, you know, my First mind said, all right, it's time for you to take your daughter to get some ice cream. And the other second mind, like, bro, you don't eat. You, you know, you don't do dairy. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but I go with that. Yeah, but I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go with that first mind because it's going to bring joy into my daughter's life and everything. And, and I see the kick out of it when I say, let's go do this. And I'm like, man, if I just said, no, nah, let's not, you know, we're going to go do something else, then it wouldn't have been that same type of vibe. And I think that we have to learn that that first mind like Ryan said, it's within us, but it's always something trying to hold us back. Life is you're not going. Life is not going to give you. Life is not going to be easy, and you're not going to be able to reach success without roadblocks. Right. And roadblocks are what that second mind is providing for you. It's stopping you. It's that fear. Um, but I believe that when you, it's man, it's just all about mindset. When it when you know, and so it's like, how do you build that mindset? You build your. I feel like. Man, for me to be how I am today and never seen this before, you you have to instill in yourself that 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 daily vision. You have to instill in yourself that you can be different tomorrow. So you might be struggling seriously today. But if you wake up tomorrow like, man, I can be something more, then you work to be something more. And a lot of people just say, man, if I'm not shit today, I'm not going to be shit tomorrow. You know what I mean? And, and it's, it's not about your, like, it, it, it is about your surroundings, but it's not. You know, because at the same time, I'm putting myself in the same communities that I was brought up in with a different mindset. I'm able to go around the same people that are still living negative lives and sit there and speak positive to them. You know what I mean? And I'm not falling into a trap because my mindset is set to like, man. Mm. But you had to you had to remove yourself. I did have you to, had remove to remove myself. yourself. That's that's the biggest. It's like those old stories, right, about the, the boy going off into the yeah. to the forest, right, to become a man. Like yeah. you have to yeah. remove yourself from whatever environment that you are in. And um, then, being uncomfortable, and then right? intentionally, uh, so I, I want to go <laughs> but back. you had to make that choice. Right. Yeah. Well, my, the choice was made for me, being put in this position. Yeah, like, like, like for me, I was, I, people left me. I didn't have to leave them. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was at my lowest, I, nobody else was around. Mm-hmm. But you could have chosen to stay mentally disabled right. yeah. at that moment, and you chose not to. Right. Well, that's because with nobody being around, <clears throat> I was able to think that I, the change that I had to make was for myself, you know, like, but when I was come, like when I first got paralyzed, people still came around. So I was still trying to do the same things I did before I got paralyzed. Well, when they disappeared, my mindset started to change. and was like, man, Wes, like nobody's around you. Nobody really gives a fuck. So now you got to give a fuck about yourself. 
and that's where it's at. You know what I mean? And, and as soon as I started to make those steps and say, like, man, it started, it was amazing. Like, it was like, you know, lost 100 pounds in a year. Like, dude, I ain't never lost weight. I, and I lost it in a wheelchair. Like, you can't tell me nothing. <laughs> like, you know, so that's, that, that was the... That was the thing, like, right. I was able to have people leave me, mm. right. but I think that's why my, mm. my, my purpose was so, so strong is because mm. man, life was, sent them away. There was a point in my life, man, probably about six months when I had the same prayer where, where I, I knew I wasn't strong enough, you know, and I said, God, just remove it for me. Because there's times, and I think, I think that own, and, and, and Ryan, you phrase this, Beautifully, man. When you say like, make make the make the universe do less work, do do more of the work. You know what I mean? Like, put yourself in a position where you're acknowledging your life, where you're acknowledging everything's going. Even if you don't know what to do with it, that's one of the biggest things I realized that it, a lot of people stop themselves from doing whatever because they say, "Oh, I don't even know what to do yet." But I've realized, man, if I just put myself honestly and authentically in the space of saying, "I don't know what I'm doing. I'm afraid to do it." But I, but I want more that somehow like someone will come along and say something and be like, that's just, yeah, it was just what I was needing to hear. You know, and then like that will turn into something. But like that space between like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to just step in. I'm going to accept it, like the vulnerability of that. I mean, that, that has been transformational to me because then I realized like, no one knows what the hell they doing. You know, <laughs> like I got to this point where I'm like, no, no one knows what the hell they doing. So we all going to just figure this shit out together versus like believing the someone had yeah. to figure it out, right? Like someone, we, we, we believe so firmly that other people already have it figured out. Or we, or we have our own perception of what normal is. And so we try to be normal. You know? based, based on what, what, what. Uh, we, we got the 10, 10 minute warning. So I, I would love to take the time and for each of you to go around and, and just share one part of your life story. Um, it could be a day, it could be a decade, a moment um, that you feel like has meant the most to you. Um, and that inspires you the most today. We start off wherever. Right? I mean, look, that boy, look, I look him right. Hey, 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 hey. You know he got it. Right. <laughs> you right want to start us off? Hey, all right. Kick it off. All right. So he said, I'm going to inspire oh, y'all real quick. We got, we got 10 minutes. Yeah. Take your time. The most important point of my life was the day I got shot. That was the day I was reborn. You know, and it, you know, I, the old me died that day, but the new me was reborn. And so that's that's like the biggest inspiration to me in life, like you know, knowing that you can be reborn, and 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 being laying on that ground, thinking that my life was over, and I knowing that it was about to be, it was just about to start over. So that's me all day. All right, we should have Wes go last. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Look at Ryan, like Ryan, like, like damn, I knew he was gonna say that, man. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, bro, because it's crazy. I mean, not to not to go crazy with it, but, you know, that situation is so inspiring to me because, you know, I knew Wes when he was walking, mm. right? And I knew what kind of person he was. And to see the whole process for him to be where he is is like, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, and I can't say it enough. Right, I don't, like us being in the position we in, I don't mind stroking my brother's ego, mm -hmm. right? That's what we, that's that's what we need yeah. to do, <laughs> right? We need, we need to tell the people that inspire us, mm -hmm. look man, the things that you went through, mm -hmm. right? That you didn't run from or give up on, mm -hmm. I ate from that, mm -hmm. right? It, it fed my spirit. So it might not be like a situation that happens to me, but when I see someone close to me have something like that happen, right? How, how can I really complain about anything? I get affected by things, right. yes. Right. But to see something like that, like, it's crazy. Like, on, it, it, it's crazy. Like you see it on TV, like, yeah. fuck out of here, right. right? But when you see it up close, right? And you see the depression, you, you, you see the, you see the, the family, mm. right? I didn't see homie laying in the bed. I seen everybody else scared that he was about to die. Mm. Right, so that perception was like, shit. Mm -hmm. oh, I gotta be up here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't wanna get a call and be gone. Like, I can remember his sister calling me like, hey, Wes just got shot. I'm like, what? We was just at his house the night before playing Madden until three in the morning. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, I don't know if he gonna make it. What? Mm -hmm. 
And right to see him here now, he's like, no, nah, dog, I don't even want to walk no more. Right. Matter of fact, I forgive the dude that shot me. I'm good. Mm. If I see him out, he's like, thank you, bro. Mm. You saved my life. Don't even know it. Mm. Right? Mm. That's, that's power. Yeah. Right? I, my story ain't nothing. <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't got nothing. <laughs> it's part of the show, goddamn. You got to give me something, man. For real. All right. Damn. <laughs> Like, powerful, man. That's hey, powerful. Yeah. Stay, come on, but somebody stay with you. Something. What, what, yeah, what you got, man? Somebody got something. <laughs> my biggest one, actually, I say. My <laughs> I'm trying to hype y'all up. It's, 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 I'm like, oh, mine ain't that big, you know. <laughs> so my story is a little too twofold. Uh, I actually lost my brother, so it actually came from a loss. Uh, I lost the closest. Like I moved to from Mississippi here. Uh, with him he was like the the man my my road dog we was together every day so during the process of losing him i was broken you know i didn't want to serve i didn't want to help anybody um but just battling through that it allowed me to see my powers it allowed me to see my potential it revealed so much to me uh but being a product of our environment and being where we're from what schools we go to different things like that it just allowed me to want more. I just wanted more over my life. I wanted just, you know, uh, it, it it opened up my vision, you know, and it's sad to say that I had to lose my brother to understand that. That was the only way. It was, it was the only way that you were gonna find you, right? It was the only way, right? Like I was saying earlier, we all get signs, right? We all get signs of the things we're supposed to do. Like, all right, man, I'm trying to show you what you're supposed to change before I leave you no other option. No. So now, so now every kid that I see and I interact with, I see my brother in that person, you know, I'm, you know, I'm caring for them. I treat them like, you know, they're my own, they're, you know, a part of my family. So, yeah. Man, the awareness that they, yeah. they oh man, we are so blessed. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm so, I mean, I think so about it every crazy, day, especially man. about to be 30 this year. Thank God, you know, being able to make it to that place. A lot of my friends I grew up with, you know, are not here, mm -hmm. you know. It's, I mean, it's real. Like the person I graduated with, sat next to, got murdered three days after graduation. Like, so you know, just started losing people left and right. It's almost got to that feeling where I was like, man, I, you know, I might be next, or I don't supposed to be right, here. Right, right. So everything that I do now, every day, every day that I wake up is a win for me. So, yeah. What's up, ladies? I mean, we need yeah. some input. I mean, I don't think mine's that deep, <laughs> but um. So my my sister, my, my family is originally from Venezuela, and I lived there. Um, I moved to the U.S. when I was seven, um, and my older sister, my older brother, they're from my mom's first marriage, so they're my half-siblings. My sister had already got married. My brother was playing rookie ball, so I didn't really get to hang out with them as much, and um, I would see him a, a couple times every year, but... Um, my sister and her family had to flee uh, about three and a half, three years ago, um, just because of the situation down there. And I just remember thinking, like, she's so brave. Like, she's she's uprooting her entire family because she's fighting for a better life for her family. And she's going to come to a different country, not know the language. Um, you know, and I just always saw, like, that's so strong. Like, she's willing to start from scratch. Like, wow, that's amazing. But I think couple years after that she told me that she looked up to me my older sister told me that she looked up to me and that was the moment that I realized that I want to be influential and I don't know what exactly that looks like and I don't know exactly how I do that but that's I want to have that effect on other people and I didn't do anything special I mean I, I worked I helped I you know but that was a moment where I was like, ooh, whatever this was. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I want that a lot. Um, and so how do I do that? And that's kind of what I strive to, to achieve every day is what can I give to others? And in my own actions, how can I influence other people? I know, I know a handful of people that, are, that are either their parents or immigrants, they've immigrated. And, and I, 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 can't, I can't fathom, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to go, I want to go visit, but like, to just have to leave, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're like, we out. Mm -hmm. you move, and you just leave the country, mm -hmm. and you go to a different, you've never been there, don't know the language, don't know, and you just. You don't even know what you're there for. You're, right? you're just, and, and you don't know if you're ever going back. You don't ever know if you're going back to the place you were born, the place you grew up, the place all, all your family's from. Like You just never know if you're gonna go back. It's, it's interesting how 
uh, you hear stories like that, right? And it, it's funny how when people from another country, their perception is ingrained, right? Like the tenacity is ingrained, right? Like you can literally uproot your whole family into another situation with a couple of dollars, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we live here, right? And can't get down the street with all the money in our pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, we right? It's, problem about something that it's crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and so we got to quit making excuses, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not our circumstances. It's not environment. Right. It's not your mom ain't there. It's not because your dad wasn't there. It's not because all the people left you or your friends. No, it's you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sooner as we can get kids to understand that they are the Superman to their whole entire life, that ain't nobody coming to rescue you right. but you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put on the life jacket, you're going to die. That's it. it's, it's, right. It's, right. Listen, you're going to be in a box, right? right? So maybe, like, like I, I said before, we, we can't make the horse drink the water, right? Mm -hmm. But our goal is to create a vision so detailed that they have no choice right. but to drink it, right. Yeah. Right? right? Like the vision's so strong that they thirsty. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> shit, dude, it. like, so oh my God, like, yeah. damn, I'm thirsty right now. Like, you ain't got to tell me no more. You didn't create the vision for me. Mm -hmm. I want to go find the lake. I'm, I'm thirsty right now, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't, again, we don't push people into transformation. We transition them. So let's... So I think that mine came from the moment that I realized that I was different and that I wanted to be different. So in my industry, um, there are not a lot of women. There are not a lot of minority women. And, you know, I always saw the I'm not this or I am this in a negative light. And the moment that I used the negative I'm not or I am and flipped it and said, well, this is actually my, my superpower right now. Mm -hmm. I'm in this industry of all right. these white males, mm -hmm. white old males who can't really relate to mm -hmm. the minority culture. So when I saw that opportunity and saw that I could mm -hmm. now impact people who had never been talking about finances, mm -hmm. who finances were something that were a foreign language, I think mm -hmm. that that allowed me to really take that next step. Mm -hmm. And wow. I think that it's a whirlwind of opportunity mm -hmm. for, for so many people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Into yeah. yeah. You can, you, you two have both shared a story. You can present a different one. You can present the same one. Um, I think something that was impactful for me, man, was um, at a young age, man, I, like, I've been close to death my whole life. I don't really talk about it too much, man, but um, when I was a kid, man, I lost my dad, my uncle, my older brother, my grandpa within a year wow. as a kid, right? And it, it's always been one of those things, so it's almost kind of forced me again. All the people that were like me died. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I related to die right so my remaining family i'm a unicorn mm -hmm. in my family right so it almost propelled me to either want to exercise my difference mm -hmm. or wallow in it and complain that i'm not like everybody else mm -hmm. right so it wasn't until i chose a different perception of again it's not i'm glad that i didn't have those things right because if i did i might be modeled my life after them instead of choosing my own right right <laughs> Man, mine were like, like kind of near death experiences as well. You know, uh, having a gun pointed at my head, bro, like almost drowning in Venus Beach. <laughs> I love Venus Beach. That would have been a beautiful place. Imagery was crazy. Like, take me. Flashbacks, bro. <laughs> But yeah, my diesel going 80 miles per hour on the highway, man, like uh, being a shit. A whole lot of stuff that I shouldn't have been in, mm -hmm. man. Like Facts. a lot of near death experiences. Facts. A lot. And it just helped me realize, man, any moment I could be gone. Mm -hmm. What am I leaving yeah. behind? What impact yeah. am I you know, leaving behind? Yeah. Right. Like, what's my story? Like, how are people going to, sh like, you know, share my story to generations after me? Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, bro, if I was to die right now, 
My story sucked. <laughs> 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 In the build-up, oh, oh, I'm, like, oh, I'm, like, I'm like, no, oh, my God. God. Hey, I'm like, no, nah, hey, I'm going to live my whole life. You know what I'm saying? The pause. Yeah. Yeah. The pause. Oh, your, yeah. life, your life will never yeah. suck, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you changing it, but, bro. Oh, like, now man. it's like I'm involved in great environments. I'm meeting people, networking. I'm shaking up my comfort zone. Mm. Like, mm. I'm in new Worlds that I never Where imagined myself exactly. With, boy. Right, right, right. Uh, With a button up, you ain't got a t shirt on. Like, hell, you you committed. Yeah, yeah, the top button is up. It's a tie. Strides, you know? Right. Yeah. Man, I'll then keep... the gators. <laughs> then a fedora. Hey, hey, one step at a time. I'll, I'll keep my short and sweet so we can get to this food, man. I think I must have been like nine years old and we were latchkey babies. And, and where, you know, your mama gave you a key. Me and my brother would walk home together. And uh, my brother used to get me into all types of shit when I was a kid that I shouldn't be doing. And my mom always said, why did you do that? I mean, Derek told me to do it. And she'd get mad at Derek, but we shouldn't be listening to him. My whole, like from like six to like when I was a teenager. And I'm never gonna be like nine, walking home, walking on the bus, you know, and I could see him like coming up with something, like thinking about something mischievous to do. Yeah. And, and he was like, Nick, let's climb up to the, to the roof of the house and jump off. And it was a one-story house. And I'm like, I got every reason in the book why this is a bad idea, right? But he was the big brother. He's going to influence me. There's nothing I can do. And so, he, so he, we climbed up the tree. Then we can get up there. I'm like, okay, I'll let you go first so I can see. So he, so he get up there. I see him climbing. I started trying to like get out of there. You know, like, where are you, where are you going? Come on, come on. Don't make me come down. Because he was wrestling me and beat me up and stuff. So I'm like, shit. All right. So I climb up there. We get it. We get, it's like one story. I'm like nine years old, right? Leaning over the edge. And I'm like, well, this, is, this is a fucking horrible idea. This is terrible. This is, this is not going to work. And I'm thinking I'm gonna break both my legs. Something's gonna go wrong. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this. And he grabbed me. He said, "We're gonna jump on three. One, two, three. And next, I'm in the air, right? Hit the ground. Boom! My legs shake, wobbling. I'm like, oh, hit the ground. I can't feel my legs, right? And then, and then it went away. And I was like, let's go do it again. You know, like. Oh. And then we did it like all day, right? And boom, <laughs> wobble, hit the ground, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, that stuck me as I got older, like that impact of hitting the ground, boom, like that initial, sh the fear is worse than almost hitting the ground, you yeah, know, but still e true. even hitting the ground, like, but you, you be all right. Yeah, Not, yeah, nine yeah, times yeah. out of 10, you're going to be all right. And like that, like the physical, like talking about working out, like training, like that physical pain and coming back made me realize like, you, you're going to have the fear, you're going to jump something, you're going to shake a little bit, but get up, go do it again, you know? Man, let's let's enjoy this food, man. Did you have? Right. No one came out. Like, no, no one came out, man. No. <laughs> lazy because I burnt my hand in the kitchen today so I told Nick to go get some easy ingredients for me but I kind of still went above and behind you know me I'm all Chef Jay West so. you know how it is man it's the best part it's when they eat you feed their stomachs and souls man you got the best the youngest the baddest 22 year old chef in the United the man's a legend Man, but he tell it. I was so ready for the 
the goggles one. We'll let you. Hit him with the goggles is what he said. I'm, I'm waiting to be hit with the goggles. Hit him with the goggles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Ryan, like, man, you all got. Right, all, right, all right. All right, come on, come on. So, so, Chef Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be perfect, though. You ended out fat, and then, and then you can tell the story. But So, this last segment is called Innovators Toolbox, where essentially we'll go around this room here, and, and everyone will say one idea, one reflection from the conversation that they would leave behind in this metaphorical innovative toolbox. Should we do it differently? Yeah, well, I'll, 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 yeah, you do whatever you want to do, I man. don't want to go first. It's not. I want to okay. be inspired. <laughs> okay. So I can kind of... He right. can still go last, okay. I want to get my mind. So okay. I've been cooking and sweating. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to start over here. <laughs> Yesterday about leaving. Yesterday, yesterday don't care about. Uh, oh yeah. Don't care about you because it's yeah. gone. It's already gone. gone. Yeah. yeah. That's what you're going. Yeah, yeah. We're going with that. Ah. Uh, 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 that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a quote of the night. night. Wait, yeah. I got you. That's a quote of the I night. I dig it. He used something else that someone else said. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like that too. I felt. I felt it in the heart. Because it's only based on what we've talked about today. Not no, usually. Sure. Hmm. Um, Not usually. Zig, where you zag? I'm, oh I'm with that since the oh first. That was the first one, right? <laughs> that was the first. That was the nugget. All right. Are you up? Right. We're going to go in the circle. Oh. Uh, vegan tacos. <laughs> vegan tacos are must. Um, <laughs> I would say that um, we should always be in the position of challenging our own perception of life. So I'm going to go a little off of that and say, you know, I think we should always be open to new opportunities, new relationships, never shut any doors. Mm. Um, I'm going to make this real long for you to write down just so, so you know. But I think with that, you have to have a little bit of skepticism and you got to ask a lot of questions. That's good. You got to get the book principles if you have not read it. I will get it from Amazon. Yep. I will borrow it. See, it's right there. <laughs> Seriously, I literally think that that I mean that's something that he speaks about. And since I think, Love that. yeah, be grateful for each and every failure. Mm. I'm lucky to know her. <laughs> She's my friend. Hey, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said. Curry with the shot. He said, "Now I'm gonna sit back here and chill, cuz my life don't suck no more." All right, all right, man. What if different was normal and normal was different? Then everybody would seek to be different. Nothing amazing came to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> all this happened, like I expected. It to be. <laughs> so I am going to switch it up and leave you guys with. I'm gonna leave the innovators toolbox with a question. Hmm. What is your purpose? Hmm. That's it. What is your purpose? Fill in the gaps. Hmm. What do you mean? Be a Man, like sometimes you're going through failure and your failure can like lead you astray from your vision, you know, but it just basically creates a bridge between where you need to be, you know, so it's like the best way to get to that is fill in those gaps and find ways and solutions to build. So hold on y'all real quick, the goggles. <laughs> <laughs> Give them the goggles, bro. Every morning, what goggles are you putting on? What? When you wake up in the morning, what goggles are you putting on? You know, sometimes people lead by what they envision. You know, when you're walking down the street, three people could be walking down the street and you finally get to your destination. You and your homies are like, okay, bro, it's like, did y'all see all those opportunities to network? But then you got that one person who was, bro, did y'all see all those cars that were unlocked? I could have broke into them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's seen it differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what goggles are you putting on to help impact somebody else's life? Good job, hey, bro. <laughs> I was wondering where this goggle story was going. Go. Under a minute. That's, that's a social post. That's, solid, that's a social bro. post. We'll start, we'll start here. Dan the man. Good stuff, brother. I would say trust the process. Mm. You sat down for that. I know. 
It was a lot. You, you got into it was, like, it was, it was, it was he looked like he's about to get interviewed right now. <laughs> trust okay. the process. Trust the process. We've had a lot going on at the studio recently, so I'm just like trying to like really take this all in and realize like this could be an episode like just legacy. Like it's cool. This is mm -hmm. something that gets recorded. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna leave something, I like want to try to leave them something that's on my mind. Mm -hmm. Be prepared to do something for the first time. Nice. Yeah. I like that. Nice. Oh man, that's strong. Yep. Oh, oh. It's like an oxymoron or doesn't. It's like Ludacris' first album back for the first time. I would say do the job that nobody wants to do. That's how I dropped in the editing and got into film. Everyone just wanted like, oh, I want this and that. And I'm like, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, wait, this is actually cool. <laughs> Just, just pursued it. Yeah, I'll dig it. Yeah, the, the same, the same guy I was working gotcha. for, uh, who taught me everything I know about fundraising. Uh, we were doing a, a speaking of fundraising, we were doing a, um, a Fourth of July tent, and we were taking like boxes out and stuff, and throwing them in this dumpster, and we threw some. I mean, he's the CEO of, the, of a community foundation, and he threw some away that, that he didn't mean to throw in there, and didn't even blink. Jumped in the dumpster. Yeah. With the clothes, the suit, suit, the tie, he dumped mm -hmm. in, was like, boom, found it. He said, I'll never ask you to do anything I wouldn't do first. Mm -hmm. And got back out, you know, right. and I was like, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> this man's 65, oh, you know, like. But to that point, like, even with my janitors at, at the school, like, sometimes yeah. I ask them, like, hey, give me the mop, I'll do it. Because right. I wouldn't ask you to do this, you know, something right. I wouldn't do myself. Mm -hmm. But when that happens, it's like they have more trust in me. Mm -hmm. Like, when I ask them to do something, it's like, he's not trying to belittle me because right. he's above me. It's right. like, it's just we a job together. that needs to get done. At the end of the day, right. Oh, hey. Boy, that seat looks intense. Um, sure, well. <laughs> 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 oh, that's crazy. Yeah, he's funny. He's funny. Uh, if there's one thing I could leave behind, it would be to keep trying. Keep trying. Jay. Jay. Well, Jay gets back Jay's here. I got a text say, message like when we were doing all this, and it's from Paul. Mm -hmm. And he goes, got a great quote for you. And it says, sometimes you fall down because there's something down there that you're supposed to find. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. That's I was like, are you eavesdropping? Right. Like, are you around <laughs> here? That's that's good. Good. The universe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jay. Cool, I'm up. What okay. you got for us, man? When... <laughs> <clears throat> when you have a big vision or a big goal or something big to accomplish, you have no time to waste. And at the very same time, you, you cannot afford to rush it. Jesus, bro, that's... Hey, that was like a oh, mic drop. Mic drop. Right, like. Right. Except this is more of a mic abandonment. <laughs> <laughs> he can't really drop a mic. But... All right. <laughs> so, uh... I'll, I'll, I'll start mine with the story. So I got the chance to take some of my students to the state capitol to, um, to meet with some of our state representatives and a few of them got to meet the governor. It was pretty sweet. Um, I don't know if you've, any of you have been to Kansas, the uh, capital of work in Kansas, but you can like walk, it's like a st spiral staircase and it gets like tighter and tighter than you. It's like real tight. You can walk all the way to the top above the dome and stuff and look out the top. No elevator? No, you gotta walk, you gotta earn it. It's, they tell you it's like 298 steps. And, so we, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta earn it. You gotta just do it. And then he touches Pepe just to make sure. And it comes every single one. Make the so, world so more we walk, accessible. So we walk, we walk it up, and I'm like, one by one, like students were like, boom, out, you know. Well, I'm, the the <laughs> I'm going back, I'm going back, right? So maybe like eight of us made it to the top. And as soon as we get up, you know, all of them pulling out their phones, recording it, you know, we are outside of the top, right around it. And they're like, Mr. Wheezy, ain't gonna take no pictures? And I was like, nah, man, it's just one of the moments I'm just so keen, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, so, so mine would be like, never forget the moment is all we had. Mm -hmm. You know, like, this is it. Everything is moments. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I got. Everything is moments. I experienced that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Stan, was that true? Did you go when we went to City Hall? Back when we did the Built for Success? No. You I didn't go to all. What's funny though, <clears throat> me and Stan have history. Y'all know that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back like, when you I know was, your business. Right. Yeah. 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 
we know. We know. We know. But we actually have real history. Uh, Stan was actually a mentor of mine. Um, we used to do something called Room of Success Camp. Uh, my uncle Joey, uh, barber, a lot of things around here. Uh, he he hosted this camp every week, and it was just a lot of uh, a lot of grown men, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, and they gathered up a lot of uh, young men in high school in the six four one three zero three one area, and they just took us around Kansas City to do just a lot to learn about business, how to balance mm -hmm. your money, stocks, uh, um, how to start a business, how mm -hmm. to dress, how to uh, tie tie, how to wear a suit, you know. So Stan, you know, he actually played a big part of my life just in those yeah. summers of being able to shape me into what I am today. So, mm. once again, thank you. Let's give it up for that. Man. Yeah. 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 They say that there are three levels of conversation. Level one is when people talk about other people. Level two is when people talk about events. There's nothing wrong with either of those, but this is level three studio. Level three is when people talk about ideas and what is possible. Thank you all so very much for joining us on another episode of Level 3 Studio, where we fed your body, fed your mind, and hopefully, without a doubt, fed your soul. Sure. Like, uh, go on. I had to make sure I didn't hide it. He said, you're taking